so this is uh, big business goes net zero, virtue signaling greenwash or not. So we're going to be discussing um, businesses, seeing uh, whether their commitments on net zero are, uh, can be trusted. We have got a, a wonderful panel here this morning. Um, but before we get to those, I've got to do the plug for CERN. I'm sure you already know. But the Conservative Environment Network is the independent forum for um, conservatives who support net zero, nature recovery, and resource security. Um, my name is Lindsay Jones. I'm the Senior Climate Program Manager here. Uh, thank you very much again for joining. Special thanks goes to WWF for sponsoring this and making this panel happen. Um, so thank you very much to, to Tanya. We'll start with a few short remarks and then head over to you guys for Q&A. So do get thinking of your questions now and we will try and get through as many as possible. Businesses are facing more public scrutiny as consumers uh, demand more eco-friendly products and services. Meanwhile, the UK government is introducing mandatory climate plans um, for some organisations. And as, as pressure on companies mounts, false claims of sustainability um, are also on the rise, with companies like Coca-Cola, ASOS, HSBC, all facing accusations. So how can companies step up their game and how can we trust them to deliver? To answer that question, we have got some wonderful speakers. We've got Felicity Buchan, um, Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. Congratulations on your new role, Felicity. Thank you. We've got Tanya Steele, Chief Executive of WWF UK, Louis French, the MP for Old Bexley and Sidcup, and Polita Clark, Associate Editor and Business Economist at Financial Times. I'm going to head over to Felicity first for your opening remarks, please, Felicity. Great. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here because green finance is so important, one to the country and secondly to government. I do want to say up front that green finance does not fall under my remit at Treasury. So I will give you a broad outline of government's thinking, but I am not going to be in a position to answer very technical questions or to extrapolate out on government policy because it is handled by my colleague uh, who is the financial secretary to the treasury andrew griffith who is an excellent colleague uh, but let me come back to the broad overarching thoughts on green finance. As I say, it is a key priority of government and for a number of reasons. Firstly, this is a very substantial market. So globally, there are $35 trillion of assets which are ESG. That's one third of total assets. And in the UK, there are 9.4 billion a trillion of assets, which is almost half of UK assets. Now, obviously, within those assets, there is a wide range of the ESG nature of those assets. So the vast majority of them are considering ESG with a small percentage, it's roughly 1%, which is actually doing impact investing on ESG. But it's still a huge amount of assets dedicated to ESG. And there is huge demand for the public for this. 70% of the public have said that they would like their investments to, quote, do good for people and planet. So a huge space for the investment industry. Uh, in terms of our ambition, we not want to be number one in green finance. And in fact, in the last green, a global green finance index, we were number one. But that is clearly our ambition. And there's a number of reasons why we want to do that. The first is that we very much so back our financial services sector. When financial services are working, the UK economy is working. And financial services are a great route to deploy capital in the areas that we want to deploy capital. So we're very, very pro-green finance to make London one of the most competitive markets. I would like to see it the number one market 
for jo jobs and for growth. Secondly, green finance is important to fund government's priorities and objectives, and we are very clear on our net zero mandate. And you can see this being put into practice. For instance, the UK Infrastructure Bank has got a net zero ambition. Um, this is also very important for consumer protection, and this takes us on to the whole concept of greenwashing. We feel it is very important that we do have full disclosures on climate and the environment. One, so that consumers and investors can make informed decisions, and secondly, because we do not want to have a situation where investors are misled. We don't want to have a situation where funds are going out saying that these are green funds, when in fact they may not be. And so that is a big focus of ours and of the FCAs. And finally, this is important because of financial stability. It is very important that we manage climate risk and that we manage our transition to net zero. So, as Lindsay has said, we've already introduced rules for mandatory financial climate-related disclosures. We're the first uh, major country to do so. Uh, we've updated FCA rules so that asset managers with comply and explain requirements need to publish how they are managing transition plans. We've set up a transition plan task force, which is jointly chaired by Aviva and with the financial secretary to the treasury. I think that is very important because we don't want to have a situation whereby people just forget about industries and divest from them because it's very important that we do see industries transitioning. And we've also helped to develop the green uh, gilt market and we launched our third green gilt in May. Uh, we've clearly also got future plans. We will be publishing a green finance strategy going forward. The consultation on that closed on June the 22nd. We will be taking forward SDRs, sustainable disclosure requirements, and we will work to help build important markets. I've already talked about Green Gilts and the UK Infrastructure Bank having a zero, net zero mandate, but we will work to assist in the building of transition finance, in voluntary carbon markets. We think that is very important. So my message here is that green finance is very important to government. We want to work alongside markets, and it's very important because of competitiveness, bundling investments into the right areas, and there is a very important consumer protection angle here. We don't want to see greenwashing. We want investors, consumers, to know what they are investing in and to be able to make intelligent decisions when it comes to their climate and nature thinking. Thank you. Wow. Bearing in mind you've been in the in, in the job a week. That was uh, incredible and so many points to pick up on. Um, but we'll go to Tanya next for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. And lovely to see everyone this morning uh, charged with coffee uh, and with tea as well. I mean, perhaps if I I'd just make a few comments from a business perspective and then the agenda more broadly. I think it's fair to say that certainly business still has a great deal more to do in terms of uh, being in a position to realise the net zero transition. Um, just ahead of uh, the COP um, last year, uh, WWF carried out some research and we found that whilst many businesses were indeed highlighting commitments to net zero, uh, less than 57% had any publicly available plan that would demonstrate how they would do so. And just if we might stop for a second, because importantly, this is going to be quite a technical discussion in terms of net zero, financial markets. 
we should remember why we're bothered about net zero. I mean, we've just gone through a summer of soaring temperatures. I never thought I would experience 41 degrees in this country. I certainly have on many trips to northern Nigeria and elsewhere. Uh, we saw wildfires across Europe, and we have now seen biblical level floods in Pakistan. So we know this is a global issue, but it is one that is actually exceeding all the averages that all the climate scientists have laid out. So we are now at the extremes of the need to make the transition uh, that we know we are acknowledging we have to make. So there is almost no time to delay. And I think that's incredibly important when we think about transition. This is about an orderly shift. It's a shift that we know is probably gonna take two decades. So when we talk about 2050 targets, we can't leave it until 2049 and then rush to the line. This is about halving our carbon impact and indeed our impact on nature every decade. So this orderly move, taking businesses and enabling we have the financial architecture to do so is absolutely critical. And there's no doubt that we're hearing the very strong clarion call from business for that help. Just a couple of weeks ago, over 100 UK businesses wrote to the Prime Minister, businesses from Amazon, Eon, Ikea, asking the UK government to set out what that robust uh, transition and net zero plan is for the nation because we know that businesses need certainty they plan in five ten year cycles and certainly the investment that sits behind them is looking for that kind of long-term planning ahead so it's supporting and enabling business from a frameworks perspective is more important uh, than ever before so frameworks and policy from government is critical and there is no doubt the announcement at COP last year uh, from the uh, UK Chancellor that really we wanted the City of London uh, to be the first net zero financial centre. As, an, as an, an individual and as an international organisation, I can tell you it sent ripples globally. Certainly my colleagues and indeed many other ministers from around the world couldn't believe the scale, the ambition, but also the competitiveness of that statement to make the UK the net zero financial centre of the world. It was asserting the City of London for the future. So ensuring that the policies and the frameworks are there to do so, I think will absolutely secure its future and indeed secure all of our futures through a net zero transition. And this again is where it will help businesses. We know that investors want the clarity that we've certainly heard today. They want to understand the risks in making those investments through business and indeed the transition process that they are going through as well. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity with the work on UK transition plans, sponsored uh, and indeed led by the Treasury to do so. And there's a real opportunity now to ensure that we do start to put that in place from a regulatory perspective as well, in terms of the financial uh, markets and services bill as well. And it would be bereft of us to miss that opportunity uh, to do so. I think we should be really aware, I guess, a couple of final comments. Um, every, many other nations are looking at this opportunity as well. We know from a greenwash perspective, green regulations perspective, certainly um, Dubai has a committee looking at how it may become the sustainable hub uh, for finance in its own region. We know that Germany is looking at regulatory tools in terms of how to tackle greenwashing uh, and more besides as well. But I guess I would argue that we probably also need to move away from this perspective of green finance. Effectively, we only have one planet shop. Our resources have to be sustainable. Green finance isn't just a little niche activity. Our mainstream needs to be green finance because ultimately we will run out of road in terms of our resources. And again, the commitment coming from UK government around transition plans, around greening our entire financial architecture is absolutely welcome. I think what's important is that we don't set a series of targets and hope that businesses will jump and be able to deliver them, or indeed financial institutions. Let's put the policy in place, let's put the framework in place, so that we can absolutely back that transition for the future as well. Thank you very much. Great, um, I'll uh, head to Louis next for some comments. Brilliant, good morning everyone. I was uh, not expecting such an audience uh, at this time <laughs> at a party conference, but it's a real privilege to get back on my soapbox about greenwashing, um, which I spent most of my career doing in the city before I became an MP um, late last year. And it's Privileged to be here with so many great speakers, and thank you to WWF and SEN for putting on this great event. Um, when I used to do presentations about greenwashing and virtue signaling, virtue signaling for clients around a decade ago, I used to talk about the good, bad, and the ugly um, with companies. 
and I think we've got to a point now, around 10 years later, we're probably at the good, trying to be good, and the ugly. I think that's where we are on that transition. And I think there's a lot of comments that I completely agree with, particularly about this being mainstream. Um, and I think actually the consumer has probably been ahead of businesses in driving that uh, change, um, often referred to as the Attenborough effect. After Sir David Attenborough, I think it, it's now in the hearts and minds of most consumers, certainly in the UK and across uh, most of the world. Um, I would look at it from three different angles from a business point of view of why it's so important for businesses to be on this journey to end the virtual signaling, virtual signaling and the greenwashing. Firstly, Felicity talked a lot about the regulatory side of why regulation was needed desperately, particularly from a consumer protection point of view, in my opinion, as a former city, city analyst and fund manager. I think there has been this huge green maze for in investors and people just trying to do good with their pensions. That has been a huge issue and still is a massive issue for the city and wealth management to overcome. And it starts at the bottom up at the company level, all the way through to your pension funds at the top of that. And it's a huge issue. Uh, Labelling, um, I had the privilege, I, I say privilege very loosely and sarcastically, of trying to digest the European Union's new green, green taxonomy as a fund manager. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, and it's part of the journey that the finance world has been on, all the way back from the Quaker movements and some of these funds were launched all the way to the present. And there's a huge issue. And <laughs> like Felicity said, I think the UK has probably benefited from not having first mover advantage on that regulation mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways. And I think we've, we've tried to do things a lot more pragmatically. Uh, but there are these fundamental issues with data um, that I think the city has to overcome to ensure that trust is maintained uh, with people's individual pensions. Uh, then moving on to why businesses should be doing it past regulation, and I think the regulation and the direction of travel is very clear to see. But access to capital, this is a huge issue that businesses are awake and alert to. The consumer is not going to accept it anymore, and businesses are not going to accept it, and investors are not going to accept it. So COP26, as we've heard already, was a huge moment uh, for the finance world, looking at over $130 trillion of investment going to be unlocked in private capital markets. I think you look at you know, principles of responsible investment, all these other movements that are going on in the finance world. It just means big businesses, small businesses just can't <coughs> ignore the direction of travel we're going on. And then linking into that is the bottom line, the impact on businesses' bottom line. So we, we obviously look at this from two different angles. You obviously have the impact of just actually positive impact of being more efficient in our usage of materials, particularly our raw materials, uh, the impact of being more energy efficient, which is I think is a subject that we're all very much focused on from a household and a business point of view, given where energy prices have been, but also the impact on profits. So I think businesses are realizing that they can be more efficient with their use of materials and their consumer demand element for b being wanting to be supported by customers that are looking at businesses that are doing the right thing. And I think this is huge and it links back in and it goes full circle and we talk about the circular economy quite a lot. But I think from an investor and consumer business point of view, we're getting to that point with businesses now where we all want to see it. Now the last plug I will make in my opening comments, and I promise to do this. Um, at the start of my career, the FT never really mentioned this area of the market. So I think the FT should be applauded for having such a great focus <laughs> on green finance and sustainability in the present. And I think the government, like I said, uh, Felicity covered, they're doing a lot of good things, but there's clearly a huge amount of work to do. And there are huge issues of greenwashing in the market that we should all be aware of. Great, well, what a great segue. Um, Felita, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Louis. <laughs> um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, such an esteemed panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Louis is absolutely right. Uh, when I became environment correspondent at the FT um, just over a decade ago, um, I have to say it was a fairly lonely sort of um, furrow to plough when it came to trying to get people interested in the idea of green finance, um, corporate climate change action and other forms of um, regulation. That's partly because the regulation didn't really exist. And as you've been hearing, I think what's really interesting at the moment is that we're really on the brink of a big shift away from the voluntary and towards the mandatory. Um, up until now, um, financial institutions have been able to basically take corporate climate action or take uh, introduce climate measures um, by, for example, joining initiatives like the Science-Based Targeted Initiative or Climate Action 100 Plus or other bodies and frameworks that are largely run by NGOs and do a lot of really good work and undoubtedly, um, I should mention WWF, uh, undoubtedly have had a big impact. But um, the number of 
firms that have been joining up to these initiatives. It's relatively small. It's certainly a minority. And so what's changing now as a result of the legislation um, and the requirements that Felicity and Louis have outlined um, is that this is now on the brink of becoming mandatory. Um, climate disclosure, setting out a transition plan, making sure that it's credible and workable um, is something that you have to do. It's not just going to be a nice to do. And it's not just the UK that's doing this, as has been mentioned. Um, in the US, the SEC is looking at similar um, measures. The EU has already gone some way down the pathway. Even in China, regulators are looking at um, carbon peaking pathways that are supposed to or will supposedly inform the um, next round of planning cycles. Um, countries around the world are doing this for the reasons that have been outlined. So for the media, um, what's, what's happened is that, uh, particularly the financial media, we have responded to regulators taking a closer interest, but also to readers, to investors, to people who really want to understand whether what the, the, the funds that they're putting their money into um, are credibly green or not. And the interesting thing I think is that a lot of the green financial regulation hasn't actually happened yet, but regulators themselves are moving in interesting ways. And so for example, just in April this year, um, the Advertising Standards Authority issued a draft uh, finding draft recommendation um, in relation to complaints that had been taken against HSBC, uh, which had been putting uh, adverts on bus stops as it has done for years, um, basically saying, you know, we're, we're green, we invest a lot of money in net zero finance, we plant a lot of trees. Same sort of advertising campaign HSBC and other banks have been doing for a long time. There were complaints and the advertising watchdog said, well, hang on, actually, um, this is giving the impression that you're a lot greener than you are because you're still financing a lot of fossil fuels, so look out. That was really quite something, and we hadn't really, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say there's never been anything like that before, but it was quite a move. Just a couple of months later in Germany, um, the chief executive of DWS, Deutsche Bank's asset manager, one of the top asset managing firms in Germany, had to step down after police raided their offices in Frankfurt, um, having been investigating claims by a whistleblower that DWS was not investing or it, that its funds were not as green as they were making out to be. Um, you know, that sent a really massive wave of uh, a, a jolt, I would say, through not just um, Europe, German or European financial um, industry specialists, but also just around the world, because it kind of showed that, you know, even before this regulation's in, um, regulators themselves are taking it much more seriously. And that's because uh, consumers, investors, the public in general, for the reasons that Tanya just outlined, are really getting worried about climate change. You know, we're just seeing physical evidence of climate change in a way that we haven't before. So I think all of this uh, means that, in a sense, we're still at greenwashing 1.0. I think greenwashing 2.0 is starting to happen now, and that is very much focused on net zero plans and how, wo how well financial institutions are going to be cleaving to them and, and really making them credible. And just last week, in fact, the banking editor at the FT um, had a really interesting story about the um, three of the banks that signed up to Mark Carney's GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero at COP26 last year. Three of the US banks, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, already saying that they're not sure they're going to be able to stay in this alliance because they're worried about legal liability. Now, you know, that's kind of been, you know, that hasn't happened, that, that, that has not been confirmed, but if, if these banks start pulling, and, and other financial institutions start pulling out of alliances like GFANS, you know, that's a, that's a big reputational risk that uh, it didn't it used to exist before. Well, I mean, there was no GFANS until last year. And then there was, uh, pr before that, no pressure to make sure that anything that came about like GFANS was really going to hold banks and asset managers and other financial players feet to the fire. So that's really interesting. And, I guess just finally, it's you know we're we're, talk, we're here to talk about um, finance, the financial sector, but it really goes beyond that. It's such a fast-moving 
um, field. If you look at EasyJet, uh, which I think was three years ago, they announced what was then quite a groundbreaking climate announcement. They were going to offset all their emissions by buying carbon credits. They became, I think, the biggest purchaser of carbon offsets in the UK. So just the other day, they've said, uh, um, screeching U-turn, no, we're not going to do offsets anymore. We are now going to invest money that we would have spent on that on things like more fuel-efficient aircraft and more sustainable aviation fuel and things that really make a difference. So, you know, that is the direction of travel. I don't see that changing, so it's going to keep a lot of journalists and lawyers um, very busy for some time to come, but I'll stop there. Wonderful. I've got plenty of questions of my own, but um, I feel like we've probably got lots in the audience as well. So um, please do start putting your hands up. We've got a raving mic, which will come round. Um, Jack, if you start with Nick behind you. Um, we'll take a couple at a time, and then I'll, I'll divvy it up between and sprinkle in a few of my own questions. Just a bit of housekeeping. Just please do say your name and organisation. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Nick Murrow, Executive Director of the Aldersgate Group. Um, great um, panel intervention, so thank you very much for that. I just wanted to get back to the point that Tanya made about the importance of businesses um, taking out net zero transition plans, and I really agree that's a key area of priority. Uh, most of our members of Aldersgate have got net zero or SBTI, 1.5 degree airline plan. There's a lot of work going on to those transition plans, but I think one of the areas of difficulty is a lack of sort of market transparency at the moment. So it's very difficult for businesses to compare their plan with, that, with the plans of other businesses in their respective industries. And it's even more confusing for investors at the moment because there's not really a clear market template. So that's where the work being led by Treasury and by Bayes around developing templates for net zero transition plans is so important. And so is the work that you are doing to lead um, the development of a UK green taxonomy. So it was really great to hear the, the extra good secretaries of reaffirming a commitment on that. But that's really a key priority for, for businesses. The other brief um, observation I wanted to make is I think the, the one of the difficulties for businesses at the moment is whilst there are some parts of the economy or infrastructure such as power where we have a very clear regulatory framework and where it is easy to invest in low carbon solutions or low carbon uh, infrastructures. If you look at, at power, we have the CFDs, we have very clear targets. That's not the case for all parts of the economy. So if you look at the built environment and energy efficiency in homes, for example, or if you look at heavy industry for those players trying to de decarbonize steel plants or cement plants, we're nowhere near the level of uh, market signal clarity or regulatory clarity that we have in the power sector. So that's an area in the, in the net zero strategy that we really need to pay attention to in the, in the coming years to, to drive um, business investment. Thank you. Great. Lots to cover there. There were a couple hands if we can grab a couple more. Sorry, Jack. Go run over to that side. The lady just over there. Um, wonderful. Hello. Uh, my name's Laura Weldon. I'm not representing any uh, co uh, company here. Until last week, though, I was working for a trade organisation which represented SMEs who made sustainable products. Um, I, um, I One of the biggest organisations in, in that um, association um, si has recently signed up for B Corp. And um, that ha that seems to be in the consumer space. This private kite mark industry seems to be springing up around um, things like sustainability um, and the kind of ESG space. But um, I personally have got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about B Corp in that I don't think it does what it says it does or i don't think it's i don't think it's robust in terms of um the ethical um ethical practice of, of businesses when you've got companies like brewdog who can get b corp accreditation and um essentially be a, a company which is 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 not uh, pulling its weight so ca how can the government make sure that um, private kite marks, which are the consumer is using as a sort of uh, a quick um, a quick pass as this is an environmentally sustainable product, um, how can they be confident in those kite marks? And is the government regulating them? Can the government regulate them? Because otherwise we're going to see greenwashing that actually private private money is being funneled towards those. 
Great, there's a gentleman in the row in front of you as well, um, and then I'll, I'll get some answers from you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me go straight afterwards. Richard Collin, United Kingdom Credit Station Service. Um, we work as part of the UK's uh, Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> great quality infrastructure, uh, along with British Standards and National Fiscal Laboratory, um, to try to make sure that we have quality in, in the things that we do, the products that we buy, confidence and trust in the market, and, and so on. And, and so following on from, from that, and also the mention of SBTI, uh, it, it strikes me that there's a, there's a, there's a place here for globally agreed benchmarks of, of performance yeah. that come through standards and through ways that are agreed and recognizable globally and mutually recognizable across, country, across countries and, and international boundaries of measuring against those benchmarks. And B Corp, SBTI and, and others are all schemes that are moving in this, in this direction. But they are, as, as, as you know, your colleague said, um, some of them are, re are relatively small. Where do we get the scalability without those global performance benchmarks? Where do we have the the, uh, the ability to make sure that, that, that we can have the confidence in the market without a way of measuring against them? Great, okay. I'm gonna um, start with Tanya on transition plans. Um, do we need a template? You know, what, what, do, what do we expect from the transition plan task force? Um, we do need a template and we are working on templates. I know there's a, a, what's described as sandboxing underway with businesses at the moment because obviously what that uh, working group, which is a, is a, a very good working group and uh, certainly has an awful lot of, of representation from business in there, uh, particularly financial institutions as well. But what we can't do is just appear with a series of templates that actually aren't usable for business. So that's critical. Um, and I think that the sooner that those templates, which are due to be uh, launched and tested at COP27, actually start to go out into the business community, I think hopefully that will increase um, uh, some of the confidence, but actually also some of the additional inputs to ensure that that is, is going to be flexible as well. I wonder if I might just make a quick comment on the broader sort of standards issue. Um, and I think it's to acknowledge that I think we've got almost a spaghetti soup of there's so many standards. And in some ways you can say that's inevitable. We've got that currently across a whole range of industries and sectors. I think one of the, the words and notes of caution that as WWF we would always ask is that we do align to science-based targets. It doesn't have to be part of the science-based targets initiative, it just has to be a science-based target. And that's the basis on which um, really we can measure some of that transition. But as ever, the priority, particularly in the UK setting, is we really would love to see not just the policy, but the very clear frameworks uh, regulated and legislated from a UK government perspective. I think that would drive an awful lot of clarity indeed. Mm. Um, I wonder, Louis, if you could pick up on the kind of SME's um, point there um, and comparisons as well, maybe touching on how do local businesses go about this? Is there going to be undue regulation or burden on them? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Lindsay. Just touching upon the, 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 the standards point, because I think this gets to the crux of the issue here. We have your point around uh, B Corps, which are, are seen as the new higher benchmark because of the issues around ESG and greenwashing. I think we've got two issues in play, and this is something I spent my whole career talking about. You've effectively got ethics, and the point about you're talking about uh, alcohol producers and, uh, and so on. Well, I, I'm, I learned a long time ago to not name individual companies when doing these panels. Uh, so, you, so, you, you, so you've got ethics versus sustainability measures, and, and as we just touched on by Tanya at the end, arguably it's a lot easier to track environmental measures and targets, taking aside the issue around scope three emissions. It's easier to track. So from an investment world, it's a lot more difficult to design products and investment funds for individual consumers when you're trying to decide what their ethics are. It's a very, very difficult grey area. So I think the sustainability side and those metrics around the environment are a lot easier and where we should be looking to start with rather than trying to dictate what people's ethics are because it's a lot more difficult to do. With regard with SMEs, small businesses, I think you're right to mention it because I think regulation at times can be designed to tackle a, a big problem without thinking about the impacts that has on the local, the small business, uh, you know, kind of one shop trader, etc. And I think this is really difficult. And you see this um, in different ways. And you know, in Old Bex and Sidcup, where I'm you know, very proud to represent, we have a different structure and different sizes of businesses across sectors. And when I go in and I speak to people and I go in on my usual visits as a constituent MP, as you'd expect, you do see the differences of how they're trying to, to manage that. Some see the clear opportunity from, from doing the transition quickly. I know there's different businesses that are doing really good stuff in this area. But also you've got uh, Jim from Coca-Cola, who's a big business in, in, in Sidcup. 
There's Jim. Hi, Jim. <laughs> I know he's speaking on the I'm not going to steal all, we, all your thunder, Jim, because I know you're doing a panel later on recycling. But I'm uh, uh, trying to do the right thing. And again, it gets point back to this point around kind of ethics and standards. You know, Coca-Cola are making big steps around manufacturing and their kind of use of kind of uh, packaging, which I'm sure Jim will talk about a lot better than I can. So again, it gets back to this point of how does it impact different businesses? How can they see opportunity uh, within kind of the consumer side, but also reducing their costs from the use of uh, raw materials? So I think there's huge opportunities, but we do have to be very mindful of the impact of burdensome regulation on small businesses because they will not be able to cope with it. They will struggle. Uh, and certainly I think about procurement for public sector procurement. You know, small businesses are going to struggle to compete if they are required, they're, you know, small five, six people in the business to write massive, glossy environmental documents. They're just not going to be able to compete with big business. Mm, absolutely. Um, Polito, I wonder if you could come in on the kind of private accreditation. What have you seen um, businesses doing and how can we overcome that, the difference between private accreditations? Yeah, I think that is a really interesting question um, because essentially what we've had is kind of a wild west of, um, of accreditation and, and standard setting. Um, in the absence, I would say, of, um, of concerted government regulation, let alone uh, or in, in individual countries, let alone um, regionally or internationally, NGOs have basically started up these initiatives and... Um, you know, it, it's uh, the, the science-based target initiative, I think, actually is doing and has done some incredibly good work. Um, questions have been raised about not, no, I mean, not, not just the sort of the, the level of um, uh, approval that they're giving, but also the fact that you have to kind of pay to play. Um, in other words, you know, you're basically paying for um, a, a, an accreditation to be given. Now, personally, I don't think that that's the, the, the biggest problem, but it's just one problem, that, and the problems with B Corps, um, some of the companies that have received B Corp accreditation, as you mentioned, are, are really questionable. I, I just think that this is kind of, this sort of uncertainty and complexity is absolutely to be expected. We've never had to deal with anything like climate change before in the way that we have to. It's going to go on for a while, but I'm hopeful that we will eventually start to see more international standardization occurring but we just have to remember you know it's kind of we're at first base at the moment yeah exactly um felicity your mm -hmm. your thoughts on all those those questions well i think what this discussion points to is the importance of the green taxonomy and that is important for a whole host of reasons one that we do have a common language common parameters Secondly, that we avoid mis-selling, coming back to the consumer protection angle. And thirdly, that we do genuinely direct finance towards sustainable objectives. So I think it all argues for a common UK green taxonomy. Uh, and in terms of the transition, wholeheartedly agree with what you say, that we need a very clear pathway on the transition. Great. OK, any more questions? We will try. There's a couple down the, the middle of the road, Jack. If you kind of go mm -hmm. down, we'll take three. Thank you, James Heal, St. James's Place. So we're a financial advice firm and have about 150 billion of assets under management. Um, Tanya, just going to your, um, well, just sort of actually the points that, that Tanya, you made in your opening address and, and Felicity, the point you just made there in terms of the certainty that, that businesses need and the importance of green taxonomy. I just wonder if I can get a bit specific on that for a second. In terms of the current work that the FCA is doing, for example, on labelling, which I have to say, compared to the complexity, as Louis was, was referring to, of the EU taxonomy was, was quite refreshing, a sort of a relatively simple, perhaps sort of, you know, a four traffic light type system attached to all investments. Um, th there were some noises about potentially sort of, you know, the government not being very happy with that work. I just wondered whether there could be sort of any clarification. And I think any work, to, to the point that I think several panellists have made, that is moving towards greater certainty, clarity, you know, greater, um, you, you know, across the piece that we can actually look at something and we can understand it is, is welcome. And so I just wondered if any of the panellists could refer to the FCA work. Thank you. Great. There's just a question behind you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Katrina Sale. I am the business ambassador for SEN, and I am also the chair of the Green Entrepreneurship Forum, which is a uh, policy kind of community for entrepreneurs who are building green businesses. 
one of the things I'm seeing with the entrepreneurs in the forum is they are spending a huge amount of time and money going through the B Corp process or trying other types of impact reporting, which is what they're calling the kind of, uh, you know, these, these kite marks of, um, of standards. And I suppose my concern is if we're only at that first stage of kind of standardizing what we're looking for, they're going to be wasting lots of time and lots of energy going through these different processes, trying to work out which one's the right one. And suddenly um, the investors we kind of have within that community are also looking for standards, but not really paying attention to them. They're like, oh yeah, they've done some of that stuff, but what are the numbers? So I suppose my question is, once we get going on that standardization, how quickly can we roll that information out to the people who are just starting businesses now? Great, and there was a, a third question, a lady just behind. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Patty Rundle, and I've been working for many, many years on bringing in standards and laws on to stop the marketing of baby foods. And I, a lot of my work is, uh, is in Codex uh, and with the WHO and UNICEF. So it's very, very important, I feel. I'm, I'm really picking up on the, the B Corps and these sort of like individual types of uh, accreditations, which we're pushing for really legally controlled sustainability labeling. I, I think the sustain sustainability labeling is really ripe for misleading and greenwashing, and yet that might go through codex. But first of all, I'd just like to make a plea that everyone remembers that in global trade, it's the ultra-processed foods that are so damaging for our health, so damaging for children's health, and yet they're the ones that are being pushed and the massive companies like Nestle and the others, are, that's what they do, that's the playground in Codex where they are pushing the most unhealthy foods and highly packaged foods and they have huge power there. So Great. we need, need to stop that. Wonderful, the first thing I really wanna pick up on is the taxonomy. Um, there's l again, loads in those fantastic questions. Um, but there's definitely been uh, recently a, a question around what ESG really means. Um, can we use it as an effective uh, barometer for, for green finance and for, for actions that are um, going to benefit the environment? So how can we define ESG if we can? Um, and hopefully what, what is going to be in the taxonomy? Uh, Felicity, I'm going to come to you because mm -hmm. I know you've been in the job only a week, but um, <laughs> hopefully peel out some, some information. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, uh, I have only been in the job a week, but I actually want to come back to the fact that this is not in my portfolio. It's Andrew Griffith, <laughs> who's financial secretary to the Treasury, yeah. and I'm really not going to start making up policy today on his behalf, and I'm sure that you wouldn't expect me to. Had to give it a try for this. Yes, but I hear everyone loud and clear. I completely buy into the fact, and it's my view completely, that we need need a very clear UK green taxonomy and that's very very clear for the reasons I previously outlined and I hear all of your feedback on that and we'll relay it to Andrew. Wonderful. Um, Tanya there's again so much to pick up on there. Mm. Um, there's a, a point on future proofing um, which I wonder if you could I'm sure talk about the taxonomy as well mm. but future proofing how do you think we can actually do that um, in the long term that's going to benefit these businesses? Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Lindsay. I, I guess a couple of points. I think from a, a taxonomy, and again, um, I'm not in the position to, to make up policy on the fly, um, but I, I guess I can and make requests. I mean, we've seen in um, Europe, within the EU, uh, some real difficulties on taxonomy. Um, and I think uh, our request would be that we don't shy away from laying down some very clear green taxonomy in the UK, because it's on the basis of that that so much trust will flow. And if we're sort of, you know, doing halfway houses or, or doing difficult fudges on, you know, calling things green that actually aren't green, I do worry that that could effectively unravel what is already a really considerable body of support and desire to move this forward. So acknowledge it's complicated, um, but again, I do think this is a setting where the UK could lead and not shy away um, from these issues, uh, you know, as we haven't as a nation, uh, not least in terms of uh, being one of the first to legislate uh, for to tackle climate change. I think more broadly on the uh, spaghetti soup of impact reporting and the breadth of that, I think we do have to acknowledge that there is so much breadth. 
Um, and I think we do tread this very fine line between individual ethics and indeed how we start to, to measure sustainability. I think importantly though, we do have to make some strides. And even if we're regulating for some of the very big businesses, let's say the FTSE 100, I think a combination of both the trickle down effects for them through their supply chains, but certainly every conversation I have with a, a large CEO is what work are they doing to enable their own suppliers to make that transition in a way that meets their targets, particularly the scope three targets that they have, but actually is enabling those businesses, whether it's through longer term contracts, whether it's to, through investment, whether it's through support around what those targets might be. I think the more that there is that kind of grown-up conversation, I think the more, certainly I, I'm seeing an awful lot of interest from those large organisations in assisting SMEs, and they certainly will need support for the future as well. I guess one final point, um, and I know uh, the lady there highlighted in terms of um, Codex and World Trade Organization. I know for many people, they'll almost be rolling their eyes in terms of, my goodness, the complexity of WTO and all that that sits. I, I think the... You know, on one level, we could do with a huge reform of WTO for many reasons, but actually also on sustainability. Um, you know, where is the Codex Planetarius that actually would start to even this out uh, globally is a question, one we're not going to resolve today. But more importantly, there are things we can do here at home as well. So when we're negotiating trade deals, where are those core standards that sit across versus you know some of the nuances that are in place as well so i do think we could really strengthen some of our sustainability targets uh, in and around those trade deals in a way that we haven't necessarily uh, been able to do to date mm, absolutely louis your thoughts yeah this is this gets to the like i said the crux of the issue and i agree a lot with tanya said there i think um i would describe this as evolution and not revolution i think this is where we are um in that journey um it's really interesting if i did a quick show of hands who thinks that nuclear should be in the green taxonomy as a positive thing right so this gets to the, the heart of the issue right I would lobby quite heavily for the government and again I'm not making policy on the on the fear uh, that it should be um, and I think this gets to the crux of the debate around green taxonomies and the issues that we have to work through um, I think the government is taking a sensible approach to that um, I will also be chasing Andrew around the conference building whenever I see him <laughs> Um, because I think this, this just does get to the heart of the issues that we're trying to solve. I think we all want the end goal to be right in terms of clear transparency about around green taxonomies, what businesses are doing, and transparency for consumers. But we are on that journey towards that, and businesses are not in an easy place for this because they're trying to adapt, as we've heard, um, to what good is and what does good look and what's that kind of benchmark versus what bad looks like. And I think we can easily see, see what bad looks like, but we can't necessarily see in all cases and all sectors what good looks like. The other the issue that I used to have as an investor was trying to go through <clears throat> the different data metrics that are put out there in the market. And this is a particular issue that I used to get on my soapbox about around kind of index passives and tra tracker funds, which is a huge part of the market and who are really playing catch up with the active part of the market and the smaller investors. And I think there is a real issue about capital being misallocated to certain companies here um, that we all have to be very, very mindful of. And I know it's something the FCA are very conf conscious of um, because you know, I look at some, you know, kind of ethical tracker and you see some of the companies in there and it goes beyond that questionable, you know, would it, will it pass the sniff test? And the answer is no. Um, and I do think there's a huge risk from a consumer confidence point of view in the market with that. And I think the FCA really have to take that very seriously. Um, and it does feed through from bottom up issues of data. So the data providers in the city, it's become a business within itself. And I know uh, the gentleman from St. James's Place will recognize this. There's, this is a huge issue here we're around data quality and what's being fed through into the financial market and what is then labeled after it so we have to look at the bottom up not just the top down is where I, I differ slightly in my view because you can put the best glossy impact report out in the world and I haven't read this but I'm sure it is um, but as an, an investor as a fund manager I would probably get a hundred of these a week sent through to me and they all look very different and they all try and measure things differently so I think this gets part to that we need to have core standards and metrics for us to look at very clearly, and, uh, but on, on the last point, which Tanya raised, I think it's really, really important actually on the kind of the ability of big businesses to help and support small businesses in their supply chains. Scope three is obviously the big one that I think big, big, big businesses are focused on, looking at their supply chain all the way through and measuring that. But actually, rewarding companies in their supply chain that are trying to do the right thing is something that I think we should all get behind. It should be a positive thing for big businesses, and it should help confidence with their consumers as that business as well. Mm. 
finally, I think there was a, there was a point on, on marketing and labelling. Polita, I wonder from your readers' perspective, you mentioned at the beginning that your readers are, are looking more at ESG and green finance and really interrogating those um, plans. What kind of things do you think your readers are looking for from marketing? I know it's not necessarily your direct area. Yeah, um, well, I think that um, there's definitely been an ESG backlash um, over the last um, six months to a year. And I think a lot of people were predicting that that would happen. And that's partly because the marketing of uh, a lot of financial products has been substandard and, uh, and has turned out to, in fact, in some cases, be misleading. So, um, you know, I think, that I, I guess I, whenever um, people raise this question about, um, just going back to the earlier questions about, you know, what should we be doing? Should we be in impact investing or B Corp or SBTI or Climate Action 100 Plus? Or what should we be actually joining and, and, um, uh, and doing? Um, I suppose I would say just really the, main, the, the one standard that's not going away and is only going to become more intensive is net zero itself. And I think as long as, you, as, as companies are focused on a plan to actually reduce their emissions to net zero, which is a massive undertaking, um, if, if you focus on that and if you have the conversation about what that means, you might find that you actually, you know, it's kind of, I mean, B Corp's nice to have, but actually just the work that's required to get to that stage alone is really quite something. And um, I, so I always just, th th my advice is just, you know, focus on the net zero plan. Great, love it. I, I mean, you're preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have got time to squeeze in a, a few final questions. Um, I'll ask that they are kept short and snappy. I thought we'd have to give a, a question to Monica here from <laughs> WWF. So uh, there you go. Hello, yeah, full disclosure, my name is Monica. I'm a public affairs advisor at WWF. <laughs> I would love to hear from the panel um, where they feel the financial services and markets bill sits, um, because as a public affairs professor, I know that this is currently passing through parliament and it's about to start committee stage in a couple of weeks. So it was great to hear um, Felicity say that we need a clear pathway in the UK um, to sort of like outline how this transition will work. And then Louis just said um, that we need a system that um, rewards rather than penalizes first movers. And we would have thought that the um, FSM bill is sort of like the prime once in a generation opportunity to seize that and sort of like send clear macro sig market signals. So. Um, very little, Tanya, um, not surprisingly touched on the bill, but not that much has been said. And um, we were a bit surprised not to see more commitment to um, delivering the world's first net zero financial center in that bill and in the narrative around the bill. So yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about what you think about it. Great, and just a quick plug, there are some great reports on your seats. So um, <laughs> please, please do pick them up. Um, there was a gentleman in the front here, and then Jack, I'm gonna make you run to the back. Uh, hi, uh, Robert McElveen from Mineral Products Association, so that's a trade association for a variety of industries, but particularly cement and lime. So the question really is about hard to abate sectors and the taxonomy issue and how mm -hmm. sort of the, the, the contrast between a hard to abate sector that has a credible but difficult to deliver plan that's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. sensitive to government policy versus perhaps a, gov a company in a much easier sector that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily trying as hard. Mm -hmm. Great, there was a guy, oh, sorry. Yeah. Wonderful. There was a guy who was stood up with white shirt in, a, in the back, Jack. White shirt is not very descriptive, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to have to take your pick, really. <laughs> sorry, not, not making your life easy. I think, I think the microphone's been given to someone. It's me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Claire Oakley, Vegan Society, Head of Policy. Um, I've got a question about uh, the growth of plant-based alternatives that we've seen in the last few years have been huge and primarily driven by kind of consumer demand uh, and technological advance. So I wonder whether the panel saw any opportunities for that kind of supporting through investment or other kind of ways that sector in transition. Okay, great. Um, first of all, financial services and markets bill. I'm very glad, Monica, that you brought that up. Um, I imagine that um, Tanya has some thoughts on this. So I'll, I'll go over to Tanya first. And, um, I was actually going to let others on the oh. panel answer that for once, bearing in mind we've asked the question, so I'll behave myself. And Wonderful. my esteemed panel. Felicity, you go first then. Yes, well, I'm going to repeat almost <laughs> my answer from before, that this actually does not fall within my remit, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to get into the details of the legislation. It is passing through Parliament, as you say. And I think that you've raised a very, very good point 
on the difficulties of abatement with certain sectors. And again, I take that under advisement and we'll pass it through. Um, I do think the net zero review is within your purview. Mm -hmm. um, what role does, is finance going to, going to play in that if we, we're going for growth? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you may be aware that Chris Skidmore has been tasked by government to do a net zero review. This is an independent review that Chris Skidmore is doing. He's a Conservative MP who used to be Energy Minister, a very, very bright guy, very independent thinking. And he has been tasked to look at how we can achieve net zero in the most efficient way that promotes growth and he is due to report by the end of December. He has quite a decent sized secretariat working with him uh, and I would encourage people with views to feed those in to his office. Wonderful. Um, Louis, what, what do you think on the financial services and markets bill? What should be in it? What shouldn't? <laughs> That's a dangerous question to ask. <laughs> um, I, I think that, again, I think that the direction of travel is right. I'd, I'd be more than happy to listen to anyone in the room that's got specifics they, they're concerned about and want, and want to talk to about. You know, I'm a backbencher. I'm not as restricted in uh, kind of viewpoints, but we always listen to um, kind of some of the concerns that come through and missed opportunities. And I think that's, that's the same for any kind of legislation that goes through Parliament. There are always some stuff that we'd probably like to see in there. Uh, and sometimes good stuff can get added in at different phases and stages within the, within the House. So any kind of feedback on that, I'm, I'm you know, happy to listen to uh, people in the room on it. But I think, um, generally speaking, as I said in my earlier comments, I think there's the, the top-down ability to, to change things, but also the bottom-up. And I think the consumer will continue driving that alongside regulation. Uh, the point about sector-specific issues, I think that's a really strong point. Um, again, looking at comparing apples and oranges, this happens so many times, and particularly around carbon footprinting. So you would get given, oh, you know, this is the best company ever carbon footprint. Well, it's a financial services firm that hasn't got, you know, spades in the ground actually trying to get uh, products that we use in, you know, most of our economy. So I would take, always take the view of looking at kind of sector-specific benchmarks for different sectors, but also looking at that peer-to-peer -peer comparisons. And I think there is more data that allows you to do that uh, as a consumer and as an investor than there used to be. But I completely agree with you that there's more work to be done there to allow actually you know, that, that, that more transparent comparison. And I think that's been a big issue, but you're completely right to highlight that, you know, not all firms are operating in the same way. I think carbon footprint and data often misses that. Uh, an example I'd give you from my city days, uh, without talking too much about, we had um, a company that was, was involved in the steel industry. And they were able, through an energy efficiency fund that we were investing in, to save significant CO2 and efficiency in their energy production, but probably both by most metrics, would still be classed as a bad company. But their, their, you know, their achievement in that period was massive for a climate change point of view. But they're still probably going to be labelled as a bad business because of the nature of their business. So I think this, this is the get back to the heart of the issue around taxonomies and, and data, uh, that we have to recognise that some companies will take longer to transition just by the nature of their products and their services. My Wonderful. Yeah. We have got two minutes left. The time has absolutely run away. It's been a fantastic discussion. So just going to come to each of the speakers in turn just to give some final comments on um, what we've discussed here today. So um, I'll, I'll start from that end with Polita and we'll work our way down. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, um, uh, I think I would just say I'm really encouraged by not just what's been said by the panellists, but from the questions. I think, um, you know, this conversation, I doubt very much, would have sounded quite uh, as it does um, a year, 18 months, to, certainly not two years ago. You know, it's just so much has changed so very quickly. And just picking up on that last um, remark there about um, hard to decarbonise. Uh, sectors, you know, it's really interesting just seeing how much work's being done, and you know much more about this than I do, on, um, where companies are actually joining forces together to try to come up with ways of funding new technologies so they can meet pressure to um, achieve carbon targets. You know, that sort of thing was kind of just unheard of and very, very recently. So I'm encouraged by all of that and very grateful to Sen for giving us the platform to talk about it today. Great. Louis, your thoughts? Yeah, just quickly, I just thank you everyone for coming. I know it's an early start. Uh, thank you to Senator WWF for putting this on an excellent event. Completely agree this is now mainstream. It's mainstream for consumers, it's mainstream for businesses, and it makes economic sense for us to be doing this and being on this journey towards net zero. Um, I think there's huge opportunities, particularly for businesses, 
uh, to benefit from doing this properly and doing it transparently. Uh, but we are, as I said earlier, it's, it's evolutionary, it's not revolutionary. So I understand the frustrations, I share the frustrations that we don't have the end goal uh, where we are in terms of metrics, but I think we should all encourage, continue to encourage good businesses to continue what they're doing. So what I say is thank you everyone for being engaged, um, but let's continue it. It's gonna take a bit of time, um, but I know Felicity and others in government are looking very carefully at these issues. Great, Felicity. Well, I also have been very encouraged by this panel. I think our interests are very aligned. Government is very supportive of the green finance agenda. I think that business is, and it's great also to hear so many stakeholders in this room are. Clearly, there are specific issues and challenges that we need to address but there are huge opportunities here. So it's great to be here as a spokesman for government on something that we believe very strongly in. And uh, final word goes to Tanya. Gosh, um, thank you very much. And um, I, I said I wouldn't say anything on the Financial Services and Markets Bill. Just one comment, because I know we'd be very glad to follow up. This, this doesn't feel like a moment at which we should falter. Um, this is an incredibly... Uh, ambitious, rightly so, piece of legislation, and it backs up some very ambitious announcements by UK government. We have an incredible City of London, we have an incredible uh, financial services industry, and if ever this was the moment to grasp it and to take leadership, uh, then it is now. I think more broadly, um, whilst I've said a number of times we feel that um, there's a spaghetti soup of targets and um, potentially uh, in terms of how best to make the transition, I would agree with the view that ultimately this is about getting to net zero in terms of halving the impact uh, each decade. But importantly, this is a whole economy uh, approach, certainly from a WWF point of view. We will need oil and cement made in the way it's made at the moment for a little while yet. But that doesn't mean that we're not trying to lay down the market for a lot more innovation and shift and change to enable some of those hard to abate sectors to make that transition as well. Uh, and I guess just finally, um, I too am very optimistic. I think uh, this is, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, and I think it is great that even despite the many struggles that business is having right now in terms of where's the level playing field, where's the frameworks, I am certainly encountering an awful lot of appetite from business. It's half of our global GDP. We need it to be successful and everything that we can put in place to enable it to be successful, I think will enable a flourishing society and economy for the future as well. Wonderful. Great optimism from everyone. Please do stick around. We have got panels all day long, fantastic ones. The next up is um, on recycling. So please do stick around if you want. Grab a, a tea or coffee. Um, last thing to say is thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to the panellists and thank you to WWF for sponsoring. Thank you.